On August 22, 1987, on the outskirts of Melbourne, Australia, specifically in the suburban area of Lower Plenty, things are as they should be. Winter is coming to an end and spring is just around the corner, offering a sense of hope to the residents of the quiet, peaceful suburban neighbourhood. In one particular house, a young family are getting ready for bed after enjoying a nice home-cooked meal together. The two children are put to bed by their mother, who kisses them goodnight, and then joins her husband in bed. It is around 4am on a Saturday, the time where most families are at home fast asleep. But on this morning, an urban legend was beginning to take form, in the shape of a masked man lurking outside the home of the unsuspecting family. The masked man quietly removed a pane of the family's living room window and silently stepped inside. No one heard a sound. As the man crept down the hallway, he made his way to the parents' bedroom and pushed their door open. He woke the parents and forced them to lie on their stomachs. Armed with a knife and a handgun, he threatened them, pretending to be a common home burglar, only interested in their money and personal belongings. He bound their hands and feet together Interestingly, using a type of knot similar to the ones used by sailors. To make it even harder for the parents to escape, the masked man ordered them into their nearby wardrobe, but not before blindfolding and gagging them with surgical tape. He locked the parents in under threat of death and crept out of the room. In an adjacent bedroom, a six-year-old boy who had been awoken by the intruder was bound to the bed and gagged with surgical tape. He was left relatively unharmed. He silently left the room and crept down the hall. This is where the masked man's true purpose was made known. He made his way into the nearby bedroom of the family's 11-year-old daughter. This is how the urban legend began and created a wave of fear that gripped Australia in the late 80s and early 90s, establishing a mythos in the minds of the public of the Australian boogeyman. The media would later dub this masked criminal Mr. Cruel. In the late 1980s, Melbourne, a city in the southern state of Victoria, Australia, was considered a very safe place to live, which most citizens would call the most livable city, due to low crime rate and a high level of safety and security, making it a perfect place to raise children. All that was about to change in 1987, after a masked man silently broke into a quiet suburban family home and sexually assaulted the family's 11-year-old girl. The attack lasted two hours, in which the perpetrator would take breaks to wander the house, use the telephone, and even made himself a meal. When the attacker left, he took at random a box of records and a blue jacket. Following the attack on the family in Lower Plenty, the police were called and brought in to investigate the crime. Without a doubt, they were stumped. This attack seemed to come unprovoked. The family had no enemies or had done anything illicit to warrant such an attack and the crime didn't seem to fit with any of the open cases in the area. The only clues police had to go off were the type of knots the intruder used to bind the family, the stolen items, and the daughter who heard the man's conversation on the telephone. She said to police the phone call sounded like a threat, as apparently the man demanded the person on the other end to move their children or else they would be next, and he referred to this person as Bozo. However, when police checked the family's phone records, no outgoing calls were made at that time. It quickly became apparent that this was a tactic to throw investigators off, a trend that would become part of his MO later on. With little clues to go on and months of investigating, the trail grew cold. It would be a year and a half before the masked man would strike again. December 27, 1988, just two days after Christmas, most families are enjoying time off from the Christmas break. But on this day, one family would experience the most traumatic, haunting experience of their lives. John Wills, his wife, and his four daughters were sleeping in their Ringwood home, just 19 kilometers away from the previous attack. John was deep asleep when around 5.45 a.m. he was awoken by the feeling of a handgun pressed to his temple. A voice growled at him in the darkness. Don't be a hero. John turned his head to see a man with a blue ski mask, wearing dark blue overalls, holding a gun to his head and a knife in his other hand. John knew to fight back would be jeopardizing the lives of his family. John and his wife were both ordered to lie on their stomachs, as with the first crime, and they were bound with their wrists and ankles with copper wire. The same unique knot was employed as previous. 
They were both then gagged and blindfolded using surgical tape. The intruder then assured the couple he was only there for money. He stole only roughly $35 from their bedside table. The masked man then went throughout the house, systematically cutting the home phone lines. He then made his way to the bedroom where the four daughters slept. Addressing 10-year-old Sharon Wills by name, this man woke up the groggy 10-year-old girl and then proceeded to blindfold and gag as he had done to her parents. He stopped to pick up a few items of her clothing and disappeared with her into the dark morning. After 15 minutes, the parents broke free of the restraints. They quickly ran to their daughter's room and were confronted with the chilling realization that their oldest daughter, Sharon, was missing. With the phone lines cut, John had to rush next door to the neighbor's house to use their phone. He then began frantically searching for his 10-year-old daughter in the neighborhood. For over 18 hours, the Wills family existed in a panicked state, worrying that their 10-year-old daughter had been taken from them for good. Around midnight, a woman driving her car near the Bayswater High School spotted a small figure standing on the street corner, dressed in green rubbish bags and a man's shirt. It was 10-year-old Sharon Wills. Sharon approached the woman and told her calmly, My name is Sharon Wills, and I was taken from my home early this morning. A man left me here and told me to go ring home. The woman that found her called the police and made contact with the Wills family. An extremely frightened father and mother were reunited with their daughter. The investigators quickly deduced the same MO of the attacker from the attack on the Lower Plenty family over a year previously. As with the previous attack, the intruder left no clues behind, and because Sharon was blindfolded the entire time, she was unable to give a physical description of the assailant. She was, however, able to give police details of his voice, in which she described him as soft-spoken. She also said that he was somewhat caring and even fed her a Vegemite sandwich and gave her some milk and lemonade to drink. Shortly before letting her go, the suspect had given Sharon a thorough cleaning, washing off any possible forensic evidence and also clipping her finger and toenails. Unfortunately, this led investigators to a dead end. Whoever this man was, he had information about evidence collecting and knowledge of forensics. It would be nearly two years before the masked menace would resurface. On July 3, 1990, in the area of Canterbury, located west of Ringwood and south of Lower Plenty, lived the Linus family. The Linus family were English citizens who had moved to Australia for work, and they were due to move back to England in several days' time. The Linus parents were at their farewell party that night, and Brian and Rosemary Linus left their two daughters alone at home for just a few hours. It was shortly after midnight when 15-year-old Fiona and 13-year-old Nicola were awoken by the angry, commanding barks of a masked intruder. He ordered Nicola into another room to collect her school uniform from the Presbyterian Ladies' College that she attended. Meanwhile, he was tying up her sister in the bed she was lying in. Again armed with a gun and a knife, he informed Fiona that her father would have to pay $25,000 if he wanted to see Nicola alive again. The intruder took the family's rented Holden Bellina to make his getaway. The two drove for about a kilometre and then proceeded to park and then got into another car. Just 20 minutes later, Brian and Rosemary Linus returned home, their rental car gone and their front door wide open. That intrigue turned to fear when they found their 15-year-old daughter Fiona tied up to her bed with a ransom message to share. Again, the attacker was very careful and left no clues or evidence behind. This put pressure on police, as with little to go on, they were racing against the clock. As with most missing person cases, if the person in question is not found within the first 24 hours, they are usually never seen alive again. Unlike the abduction of Sharon Wills, Nicola wasn't returned later that day, or even the next day. 36 hours after the abduction, her father Brian held a press conference in which he pleaded with the abductor and stated his willingness to comply with any ransom demands. Unfortunately, the Hampton rapist, as he was known, had only left behind a demand for money, but no means of which to collect. Investigators looked into business dealings with Brian, thinking that ransom could have been personal in nature. This search turned up nothing. Nicola was found alive outside an electricity station in Kew, just a short distance from her home, approximately 50 hours after her abduction. It was her 14th birthday. Her abductor left her outside the station fully dressed and wrapped in a blanket. 
and told her to sit and not remove the blindfold until he was gone. It was shortly after 2 a.m., but she immediately removed her blindfold and ran to a nearby house to phone her father. Nicola was able to provide the investigators with some details. Most prominent among them were a rough estimation of the abductor's height, which was around 175 centimeters, or five foot eight. She also said that he had reddish brown hair. Nicola was also able to provide some details of her abductor's house, which police had not heard yet. Nicola was blindfolded during her abduction, but took some very brave chances to sneak a look at her surroundings when she could. She gave a description of the room, saying that the room had peach-colored full-length curtains, beige cream-colored carpet, a double bed with a peach bedhead, an orange lamp base with a lemon and white striped lampshade, light-colored walls, and a white door. There was also a bookcase or cabinet that was covered with a dark blanket, possibly to hide personal items. She also told police that she heard low-flying planes overhead, which led police to believe that the perpetrator's house was somewhere in the vicinity of the Tullamarine Airport. Disturbingly, Nicola described being bound by a neck brace that was attached to the bed head, and at the end of the bed was a wooden tripod, which led police to believe the abductor had been filming these attacks. Nicola also heard the man talking very loud to someone else, but never heard another voice, possibly another red herring tactic that had become a trademark of this depraved man. Nicola also told police that the man would watch the news about himself and even watch the press conference that her father held and tried to talk to her about it. With a rough idea of where the perpetrator's home is, the police searched over 30,000 houses. Nothing was found. It was around this time that newspapers and media adopted a moniker for the masked man, being described by police as super cool and super cruel. The name we now know as Mr. Cruel was born. The Victorian state government offered a $100,000 reward for the capture or any information leading to an arrest of Mr. Cruel. After months of investigating and thousands of suspects later, the police had not managed to uncover anything. A wave of fear and panic swept through the once quiet and peaceful suburbs of Melbourne, but unfortunately, the worst was yet to come. On April 3rd, 1991, Mr. Cruel would strike terror into the hearts of Melbourne's citizens once more. His last known victim was 13-year-old Carmen Chan. Carmen attended the same school as Nicola Linus. Carmen's parents, John and Phyllis Chan, were hard-working restaurant owners in the Eltham area of Victoria. They worked 18-hour days to ensure that their three daughters would have a good life. They both immigrated from Hong Kong 15 years earlier. The two parents worked from 8 a.m. to midnight almost every day. They would often leave their three daughters home alone, trusting their 13-year-old daughter Carmen to watch over them. Mr. Krull must have known this, as detectives believe he would stake out his victims for weeks or months ahead of time, learning their habits. On this particular night, at around 8.40 p.m., Carmen and one of her sisters went into the kitchen to make something to eat. Mr. Krull was already there wearing his signature balaclava with white stitching around the eyes and mouth, along with a green-grey tracksuit and armed with a knife. I only want your money, Mr. Krull told the three girls. He forced the two younger girls into Carmen's bedroom closet and pushed a bed against it to lock them in. He then took Carmen with him and disappeared into the night. The sisters managed to free themselves within a couple of minutes and immediately phoned their father at the restaurant. When the police arrived, they knew immediately what and who they were dealing with. Again, with very little clues to go off, and an obvious red herring in the form of spray-painted car with the words, payback, more to come, an Asian drug dealer. 72 hours later, John and Phyllis Chan held a press conference, emotionally pleading with Mr. Krull for the safe return of their beloved daughter. Phyllis Chan broke down sobbing, holding up the outfit Carmen had been wearing the night she was taken. Carmen's sisters even wrote a letter to their sister, stating that they missed their big sister very much and that the family dog Mimi was missing them too. It reads, Dear Carmen, I miss you a lot of the time. I am very scared in the dark and mum and dad miss you very much. Mimi is sick because she misses you too. Love from Karen. One of the largest manhunts in Australian history, Operation Spectrum, 
a multi-million dollar undertaking that consumed tens of thousands of man hours and thousands of more volunteer hours. The Victorian government now offered $300,000 as a reward for the capture of Mr. Krul. The safe return of Carmen Chan was the top priority. Unfortunately, this story does not have a happy ending. Nearly a year to the day of Carmen's abduction, on April the 9th, 1992, a man walking his dog in the nearby area of Thomastown, along Edgar's Creek, he stumbled upon a weird object. He bent down to touch it and was horrified by his discovery. Returning home to alert the authorities, the police soon discovered what the man had found, the skeletal remains of young Carmen Chan. An autopsy revealed that Carmen had been shot three times in the head, execution style, and based on the decomposition of her skeleton, had likely been dead for close to a year. It is unknown as to why Mr. Krull chose to kill this poor young girl when he let his other victims live. One possible theory is that Carmen, who was described as stubborn by her mother, likely learned the identity of her abductor and paid the ultimate price for it. Operation Spectrum would last until 1994, when it was disbanded, costing over $4 million, with a task force of 40 members and with 27,000 suspects investigated, 30,000 houses searched, and even help from the FBI, Mr. Krull was never found. Today, the case of Mr. Krull remains unsolved. The reward for his capture now stands at 1.2 million. This has been an episode of Shadow Matter. If you like this video, then please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notifications bell. And together, we can explore the dark, the unknown, the terrifying, the shadow matter.